Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, let me introduce for this session, uh, Mr. Luis Valdeavellano. Luis has five years of experience as a data scientist in a big data analytics consulting company with presence all over Latin America. His work involves installing and administering the closer designing and implementing data strategies for companies and develop data products that include data processing, machine learning production models, and also complex workloads. He's also a professor at the Universidad del Valle de Guatemala and has imparted conference all across Latin America. Thank you, Luis, for joining us. Um, this, this session is all yours. Thank you, Ruben, for the presentation. I'm very honored to be here. Um, let me share my slides. Can you see them? Um, here. Yes. Yes, yes, we Perfect. can see it. Perfect. So as I said, um, I'm very honored to be here. Um, I'll be talking a little bit about my experience working with uh, a very nice project I was involved a couple of years ago. Um, about me, well, Ruben already uh, said it, but um, besides of being passionate about data science, I would also like to say that I love cooking. I actually had a professional course at Naples of pizza making. So you could say I'm a pizzaiolo. Uh, I enjoy music. I play piano and I also like to take uh, some pictures, photography. Um, all the pictures that you will see in this presentation were taken by me. Um, well, um, what I wanted to talk to you today was about one of my favorite projects uh, we had at the company I work for, where we had to be so creative. Like, um, I truly believe that creativity is like the, one of the most important assets you should have as a data scientist, um, beyond coding, uh, beyond uh, statistics knowledge, beyond machine learning uh, skills. I think creativity is like the most important because you have to have the ability to create. You have to have this ability to think outside the box. And I always say that in this perspective, uh, data science is like an, is like an art. Uh, data scientist is, is an artist. Uh, so that's how I came up to this title, uh, machine learning over small data, uh, as opposed to the traditional machine learning leveraging on big data, because uh, you are always like told to train a model with a lot of data. You, you don't always have access to these gigantic data sets. You don't always have access to information being stored uh, from years before you are working with. So it is very often that you want to do machine learning. You want to train a model. You want to be more predictive at your company, but you don't have just enough data. So that's when you have to, that's when creativity kicks in because you have to be able um, to generate new data to work with, yeah? Uh, when you don't have big data, you have to create it. So, um, and you have to create these new variables and generate them. And these new variables uh, must be, um, must have, predictive power. So um, we had this project in back in 2018, where one of our clients, uh, which is a fast food restaurant chain uh, in Central America, they gave us their 72 restaurant sales data, like just that uh, tiny table, 
with 72 rows and they said, okay, there is this amount of sales we do uh, by month on this restaurant. And the goal was to, was to predict whether uh, allocation for a new restaurant, uh, allocation A will be better than allocation B. So we are like, uh, we feel like we are in a dead end, like uh, we don't know what to do because we don't have almost any data. So that's when creativity has to kick in. And we have these data storms we call, uh, are just like brainstorms, but focused in, in data science projects. And we get together all the team and we just start proposing ideas and crazy ideas and, and say, okay, we don't have enough data. We, we have to get data from, from somewhere, from, from anywhere. So uh, among different ideas, we just thought uh, a good idea would be to look what is around these places. We have the location, the latitude and longitude. Uh, so we could say, okay, this point that has this amount of sales is between these kind of places. Like uh, it could be near a lot of, I don't know, a schools, um, be cool. It could be near a, a mall, a shopping mall. It could be near some church. I don't know, a, a highway. Uh, there are a lot of things that can be around the place. And you may think like those things may affect directly in, in the sales of our place. So that's what we thought. And we said, okay, let's get to Google. Uh, Google Maps and see what's around our places and try to generate data from that. And that's exactly we, what we try to do. But uh, going from the idea to the execution, there is a lot of, a lot of, a lot of road to, to go. So we start with this. We have a point of interest that can be a, a, a point when we, where we have a a restaurant and in Google, we could see we have some places around this point. This Google gives us uh, some additional information. So it, this could be restaurants and it also says uh, there can be some, I don't know, schools, um, some ATMs, some parks, some bus stops, um, I don't know, a lot of things can be around our point of interest, but this is very uh, ethereal in the, in the means that you don't actually know how to convert this into numbers or into information or data that you can actually work with. This is just a notion that this point is around this kind of places, but how you transform this notion into actual variables with predictive power. And there is no textbook, there is no textbook for that. So you have, again, to be creative. So we thought, okay, let's, um, let's draw a radius around this, this point and just count how many of each kind is around this point. And that could be one variable, uh, but we could think, of instead of a radius, we could think about the distances from these places to our point of interest, or we could say just the most near place, the distance of the, of the nearest place, uh, it will also work. Uh, we, we actually don't know what is going to work. And if we think about, about what to do, it, it also has its own questions. Like if we choose to work with a radius, what is the, um, the measure, the correct measure for the, that radius? So it could be 500 meters or it could be two kilometers. We don't know. And there is no answer for that in textbooks or if we search around on internet, we won't get this answer. This answer 
has to be answered using the data. And you can also see other cases like this one where it is, it is unleading, uh, the solution you are proposing is unleading of what the reality is, right? So you have to address all these things and think about how you're gonna use all this data that it's, uh, it's just data that is floating there, how you will take it and make it valuable for your project. So the first thing you have to think is about a plan. Uh, you have to define a roadmap. And that is very, very important because uh, otherwise you will just be uh, not knowing uh, what to do, where to go. And by defining a roadmap, I actually mean formulate an hypothesis. Yeah, that's the easiest way to define a roadmap is to formulate an hypothesis. And, and I actually like this very much because we, we tend to think that we are trendy, like the, this new data science thing and, and it's cool and everything, but it is no different from what scientists were doing, I don't know, two centuries ago, three centuries ago. We just have very better tools, but we have to do the same thing. We just formulate hypotheses and we try to prove them wrong or prove them right. So that's how you define a roadmap. You just think about an hypothesis. And in this very case, uh, we just said, okay, we think that if we observe the places that are around our, the places that are around our point of interest, our restaurant, uh, our restaurant sales will be positively affected by being or existing in a crowded place. And that crowded place uh, is, is, it has to have something. I, I mean, is not the same to be uh, placed, I don't know, in, in Wall Street than to be placed on uh, Queens. Like there's different types of people that are moving around those places. So we have to understand which ones are better for our, our restaurant. So be specific about uh, which kind of crowdedness you, you want to have around your, your restaurant. So when you have like a clear image of what you are trying to prove, then you go back with all these ideas and say, okay, let's say uh, the initial idea, we draw a radius and we uh, try to understand, um, try to say, okay, we have this point, this, this little X that, uh, that I'm pointing here. Uh, where's my mouse here? We have this, this little X and we have all these uh, and other places that are around our point of interest. So, um, what happens if you have this other case? Oh, this is not working. Yeah. What happens if you have this other place that like, like this other case? If you just measure a radius and count uh, the amount of establishments or the amount of places that are around, these two cases in the data, they will seem they will seem to be the same, the, the same thing. And you as a human, you can see they are not the same. You, you will prefer the first one. And it happens the same with uh, this other case where you have um, the same amount of places, but they are not as, as dense, they are more sparse. So you have to try to uh, see how you can address these different cases, these different scenarios. So uh, what we came up to was defining a centroid. Yeah, so we defined this new variable that we call the centroid. And 
it, it is just the average uh, latitude and longitude amongst all these places. So it's like the equilibrium point. Like you would say this concentration of places have this central point and we call it our centroid. And now that we have our centroid, we can actually measure things about our point of interest in, in relation to this uh, conglomeration of places. So uh, we can talk about the average distance of all these places to this centroid. And that will give us an idea of how um, concentrated the place is, the, 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 all these places are. So um, if it is a, a smaller distance, you would say it is more concentrated, like in the first two cases. If it is a bigger distance in, in average from all these places to this century, you will say it's less concentrated. So you can start differentiating between these different scenarios. And you can also have this other uh, variable uh, that is a distance from the point of interest to that centroid. So you can differentiate between the first two cases, like both are concentrated, but in the first one, you are in that concentration and in the second one, you're not in it. So now it, it is starting to, to have some shape. Now you have actual numbers that you can use to try to address the hypothesis to try to prove it, the hypothesis. So um, what you do next, or what we did next, was trying to get some uh, mathematical uh, behind this. And it is actually very fun, this part of, of the job, because you try to get a formula or a variable that will behave as you want to behave. So you have these two variables and we will call them density and distance. And we came up to this formula and, it, and it's, I know it, it looks pretty awesome and we invented it, but it is just a, a, a pipeline of logical thinking. Like we have this, uh, for example, we have this um, average distance that will tell us that is a density, but if it is smaller, uh, it is better for us. So we have to think how we use that. Um, we prefer seeing differences between small data, like uh, small numbers. Like you will say, I will prefer to notice a difference between the 50 meters and the 75 meters than to observe a difference between the five kilometers and the 10 kilometers, because both 10 and five kilometers, I will just think about them as they are far. They, I don't care, but I want to see some differences between the small numbers. So that's why we are applying a logarithm because we know how a logarithm curve will behave. And we inverted it like one over that outcome, because we want the smallest numbers to be the bigger um, index, like uh, to know that it, if the, this distance, if this average of distance is closest to zero, we want to see a, a bigger number that will tell us this is really good. And the same goes with the distance. We all also inverted it. So we came up with this uh, key cast function and we called it an economic concentration index. Like we will say, okay, we can place a geographical point and we can actually measure its economic concentration index in that point. We came to name our own variables. Um, if you are uh, wondering why uh, is ICE instead of ECI, is because its its initials in Spanish are actually Indice de Concentración Económica, which are uh, is the original name. 
So now we try to understand how this applies, applies to, the, to the cases or the scenarios we were analyzing before. So you can say, if it is a big number, like in the first case, you have a lot of concentration. So you know one over the logarithm of density plus one will give you a big number. And a big number times another big number that is a shorter distance that one over it will give you another big number. You know that a big number times a big number will give you a very big ICE, a very big index. And that's what we are looking for. In the second case, you can see uh, a high concentration, but at the distance is far. So you have a big number times a small number and you will get an index that is kind of big, but not that big. Uh, the same case goes with the third, the third scenario. Well, you have a small number because you have a big average distance of places to the center. And when you apply a logarithm and one over it, uh, you divide, you invert it, you will have a small number times a big number. You will again have a kind of big, but not that big IC. And the fourth and final case where you don't have anything. So you have a small number times a small number will give you a small index. So now that you are understanding how your new variable or your new formula behaves, uh, it is very cool and everything, but how you will apply it to data. And I will go back to what I was telling you at the beginning of the, of the session. There is no textbook. So um, you have to think what is the main input in this formula you just created? And the main input are these different places that are, are around your point of interest. So these different places, uh, how you select them, how you choose them, how you know how many or which ones you have to choose, you actually don't know. And there is nothing uh, that will tell you what to do. So the only viable answer is to try to, try to get it there, try to prove different outcomes. So we said, okay, we can choose which places we are going to use as our main input to in a in a radius defining a radius what we would have been talking all, all all the presentation so we don't know how big or how small this radius has to be so we just try different things so instead of just having one variable i will have 10 variables and one, I will choose the places with uh, 200 meters around, 800 meters around, two kilometers around. So you just uh, try them all. And maybe the radius is not the best way to understand this index, to calculate this index. So uh, you can also define it by looking for the nearest places and choosing the top 10 uh, that, that are near your point of interest, or again, choosing the nearest 50 or choosing the nearest 100. You don't know which is the correct answer. So you, ju you just come with all these different options. So instead of one having just one variable, now you have uh, 20 or I don't know, uh, in, in our actual case, we came to 16 different possibilities. We said, um, we tried with 10 different radios defined and with six different nearest defined. So we have 16 different ways to calculate this variable, but there is more. Uh, you remember that Google gives you, actually gives you um, different categories of the data. So you can calculate this index over schools, over churches, over restaurants. You can, uh, you can even 
choose with, uh, against fast food uh, restaurants, uh, high-end restaurants, gas stations, ATMs, bus stations, hospitals, um, parks. I, I mean, you have these 96 different categories that Google gives you. We actually just work with 21 of them, the 21 that better uh, gave, so, gave us some information. So we have these 16 different ways to calculate and these 21 ways to, uh, or, or categories where we can apply this. So we just ended up with 336 variables that we generated for a single point of interest. And it's a lot of information. And you now have the problem that you have a lot of information because you don't want, you don't always want that. Uh, it is obvious that all these different variables are highly correlated between them and you don't always want that. Uh, but it is a good way or, or a good solution you can give when you have nowhere or, or no information to use, uh, nevertheless. Uh, so in the final outcome, you won't actually use these 336 variables, but you may, uh, you may go that, uh, you may understand at the end of the project that if schools are important, how you measure schools maybe is by the nearest 20 ICE. Or if you are measuring uh, restaurants, probably it will be uh, restaurants at one kilometer in a, in a radius of one kilometer. You don't know. And actually in the outcome, in the final outcome, you have what way is better to measure each one of these categories. So now you have uh, data to work with. And you have to be very careful because uh, as I said before, all these variables are highly uh, correlated and that may take you to overfitting your model. And you don't want to overfit your model. So you have to be very careful now that you generated new, new data that this data actually gives you um, that actually is good for your model, that actually gives you information. And um, now it's time to uh, leverage on existing algorithms that you can use to reduce that dimensionality. Like you can use PCA, which um, Ridge and Lasso or backward and formal selection are just some examples. In this particular case, we used backward selection because if you try to use PCA, like uh, PCA is an algorithm where you can reduce dimensionality. So you have 336 variables and you that are correlated between them and you use this algorithm to ju just get, I don't know, seven variables that are not correlated between them. And, but you lose explainability. Like these variables, you can calculate it, but you don't know what they mean. And some cases you prefer explain explainability over predictive power. So you then also have to think about that. In this particular case, we use backward selection, where, which is an algorithm where, where you start trying uh, how your model outcomes by removing variables, and, and seeing how this affects to the outcome. And it is also important to be very precise in, in, in evaluating your model. Like you don't always want uh, like an R squared. Uh, it is very common. We, we actually used uh, a linear regression in this particular case. Um, and we came up with this seven, yeah, seven uh, variables that we ended up using. And besides of the ICE variables that I just 
told you how we created them. We also uh, inserted some variables of counts in a radius, uh, a simple count, and also the distance to the nearest of that category. So the final seven variables that we came to was a shopping mall count in 500 meters uh, radius. It was pretty important. Uh, also the hospital count uh, in a one kilometer area. Uh, and, 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 it, and when you came up to this, we, you think, oh, that makes sense. Because if you think people that are on, an, on a hospital, uh, maybe they are a family of an ill person and they just are not thinking about eating in a high-end restaurant. They probably, they just want something fast, uh, fried chicken that will be tasty and uh, they don't have to think about it. They don't have to wait for it. Uh, they just order uh, or they just go and buy it. So it is a good location for a fast food restaurant. And the data is telling us, you have this other, um, these other uh, variables that came to be important. Uh, the general ICE, that is uh, all the places without assigning any category, it will give you an idea of uh, the concentration of people around it. Uh, parking, parking lots near uh, another fast food chains uh, in a, in, 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 a, in a radius, bus stations and ATMs, top 10. So we came to this. Uh, if you're curious about the, the final outcome, we came to a predictor a square of 72%. It, we think it's kind of uh, very good. If you think about it, we had this root mean square error of just 382. Uh, and you have an average sales of 2,800. So you, you know you are, you are kind of good. It is not perfect, but you didn't have like any data to work with. So it, it is a great result. And if you think about the, um, the main request was to know if one location is better than other. Uh, it is not to predict exactly how much sales we, will one place have over another. So if you evaluate your, this outcome in, an, in, in, the, uh, uh, in the order of not trying to predict the amount of sales, but trying to predict if this is better than this other, we get a better result. Um, this is our final uh, uh, regression. You can say it, it's pretty good. It, it's, it's pretty good actually. And this is, the, this is the result that we delivered to our client. So this is very cool because it's a heat map and we evaluated all these places in, in a grid and we just tell them, okay, here's your map. Every place will be uh, better than the other. Like uh, if you put a restaurant in this red area, it is good place to put your restaurant. Um, so uh, that this is the outcome and, and I'm, I'm really proud of it because it was really good project and we had this really good um, uh, reception from our client. And finally, to just to wrap up, um, there are six things that I will try to um, uh, take uh, in this wrap up. Um, first of all, don't be afraid of being creative. Uh, just try to figure out, it, that is your work as a data scientist. You have to figure out um, how these crazy ideas can actually work and give them a chance. Uh, always try to define your roadmap, formulate an hypothesis, uh, be clear where you want to go 
so you don't get lost in in all this process uh, try to analyze behavior by cases by different scenarios the data will never behave as we want it to behave so you have to be aware of all the what ifs that you can get along the way uh, you can create your own function it is cool it is uh, fun <laughs> Um, apply your knowledge to make it behave just you want it to behave and manipulate or process the variables by your own needs. Don't overfit your model. You have to be very careful of how you evalu evaluate it so you know that it will be good for new unobserved cases or unobserved um situations and finally try always to leverage on existing algorithms use all the tools you have at your disposal don't try to invent the wheel again like use all the knowledge that is outside and that will be it uh thank you very much for having me here thank you very much for listening and I think we have five more minutes for Q&A. Ruben. I don't see any questions in the, in the app. OK. I, I, was, I was thinking about k-means while you were doing this, but I, I am guessing this is a whole lot more supervised than anything like that. You're, you're, you're much more hands-on than than a, than a k-means model doing something like this analysis? Or are there other versions that are more like uh, unsupervised? Well, it is definitely supervised. The, the, the approach we came to, but as I was saying, uh, data science is an art and <laughs> you can get results by so many different ways. Like uh, this is, I, I don't know if this is the correct way we work with, with but it gave us results and you ha can have many different uh, approaches. If you are uh, talking about k-means in an unsupervised way, uh, I think it's also interesting because we, we, you could try to create these clusters of restaurants and say, okay, this bunch of restaurants are the restaurants that uh, office people go to, that uh, office people uh, go in an in a in a lunch time, but this other bunch of restaurants will be restaurants that will be more uh, visited by young people. They may be near some university area. Uh, so you could uh, try to think about an unsupervised by, by thinking about clusterizing the different restaurants, about these different variables you have at, at your disposal uh, and use it however you, you think about it. So it, that, may, that makes sense to me. I'm, I'm glad I wasn't imagining that. Thank no, you very no, it's, much. It's, it's, it's a way. I think we're about out of time, right, Ruben? Five yes. minutes to get uh, to the next uh, one. Okay. I think that's a wrap up. Thank you, Luis, for sharing your knowledge. No. Uh, Matthew, I see that you have a question, but you can reach uh, on the community section. Or if you have any additional information, you can contact directly to Luis because we are out out of time of this session. Thank you very much everyone for joining us and, and we will see you in the next session. Thank have you, a Ruben. awesome day. Thank you, Luis, for sharing your knowledge and have a great day. Have a great day. Thank you. Okay, bye. <laughs>